Hello, I'm Bill Leopold, and welcome to this edition of Breakfast at the Barracks. Joining me today is Richard McCormick, president of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Dr. McCormick, welcome to the show. Bill, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I have to be honest with you, I'm kind of excited that you're here. I, I want to be able to ask you um, some questions about what you've learned about leadership over the past decade that you've kind of been at Rutgers. Um, so let's start out. What would you, how would you describe your leadership style? Well, I think the most important element of leadership is you've got you to gotta set out a vision. You've okay. got to express goals that people in the community you're trying to lead believe in. Mm -hmm. They've got to be goals that are relatively familiar to them. You can't be describing somebody else's university or right. somebody else's uh, institution. Um, but but they've, they've got to have a visionary aspect where people say, wow, yes, I recognize that, and that's something we can achieve. And I want to I join, join in achieving that. Second thing you've got to do is appoint great people to work with you, other leaders. Mm -hmm. Third, you've got to find the resources to achieve the goals that you have uh, identified. And, uh, and fourth, you've got to uh, have the courage to evaluate uh, how well you're doing and to say, uh, have we achieved that? If not, how can we achieve it? I think one of the things that you brought up was being able to make sure that you articulate goals that everybody understands. That's right. As we know, Rutgers... And, and is inspired by and, uh, and believes in. And I want to ask you about the kind of various constituents at Rutgers. You have students, you have staff, you have faculty, you have researchers, a whole bunch of different fo people within the organization who have different language, different kind of ways of t kind of building that together. What was one of the things you discovered over the past decades to try to reach each one of those areas? Yeah. Well, um, I, I have an advantage, which is that I grew up in the Rutgers community, and I served on its faculty for 16 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel at home at Rutgers. And, and I don't find its divergent constituencies to be all that divergent okay. or, or significantly at odds with, with each other. Students are students and faculty are faculty, and alumni are alumni and so forth. And, and they certainly uh, have different relationships to the institution. But, but they, all, they all want deeply to be part of an outstanding university. In the case of Rutgers, they want to be part of an outstanding state university with uh, first-rate programs in fields that are truly relevant to the 21st century, mm -hmm. in fields that, uh, that make a difference to humankind, fields in which students are interested, fields for which faculty will be uh, rewarded for, uh, for doing well in, and fields for which resources are available to, uh, to achieve the goals. Um, uh, alumni, alumni also want a university that uh, speaks to the urgencies and opportunities of the 21st century and, and want to be proud of their alma mater. Mm -hmm. um, so while, yes, uh, faculty and students and alumni are different in some respects, and staff and faculty are different, and older graduate students are different from undergraduates, um, there, there are some enormous commonalities. And, uh, and the, the role of a leader is to, is to identify and speak to those commonalities and, 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 and share a goal and a vision that everybody can say, yes, I want to be part of that. Now, one of the things you brought up was the idea, and I think you just kind of wrapped up, was the idea of inspiration. Very important. So um, besides being a top-ranked university, what's one of those things that you kind of looked at some of the inspirational context in terms of kind of heading out as you started the presidency and as you kind of wrap up, as you kind of look back and say, those are my inspirational moments to kind of rally our troops, so to speak. Yeah. Well, uh, one, of, uh, <clears throat> one of the characteristics of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, is that its, uh, its, its different elements were formed at divergent times with divergent mm -hmm. purposes. Not everything that's currently part of Rutgers was originally part of Rutgers. Not everything came into Rutgers at the same time. And every, every president of Rutgers in his own way has, has faced the challenge of bringing this institution together, taking it to the next level, um, identifying unities and commonalities where previously there may have been differences. Um, in, in, in my case, uh, the, the challenge I focused on early in my presidency was, was bringing together uh, the, the previously separate multi-purpose or liberal arts colleges on the mm -hmm. New Brunswick campus, Livingston Douglas, Rutgers University College, uh, and, and, and forging uh, something that uh, most universities already have, which is a, a school of arts and sciences right. alongside the school of engineering and uh, the school of education and, and so forth. Um, it, was, uh, it was my, my uh, contribution Mm -hmm. to the uh, unification of a university whose, whose origins are somewhat disparate and for whom unity and solidarity and commonality of goals are terribly important. 
So, so let's talk about that for a little bit. I know that you've often said it was one of your greatest accomplishments and you're kind of proud of kind of how that happened. Um, but there also was times when it seemed a little bumpy on folks were upset because there were alumni responsibilities to some of those areas. Um, you know, folks didn't understand kind of what was going on. How did you kind of make it through those, those difficult challenges? Well, from the, most important, the most important thing you do when you hit bumps like that is to sit down and listen. Mm -hmm. um, we, had, we had forums on every campus. We met with every constituency group. Uh, at, at Douglas College in particular, there was resistance to the changes that we were proposing. And, and while I, I wouldn't claim that I uh, or anyone alleviated all of those concerns, um, listening goes a long way. Uh, at the annual address that I gave in 2005 when the, when the plan was being rolled out, mm -hmm. Um, uh, the Douglas students and alumni, mainly students, uh, had three hours worth of questions following my address. And some of those questions were a bit repetitive, but it was a tremendous opportunity for me simply to listen and to also show the, everyone else present that I would respond, uh, I hope effectively, but mm -hmm. certainly respectfully to everyone who, everyone who asked. Um, you, can turn it, you can turn a challenge into an opportunity that way. Mm -hmm. Being a good listener uh, even taking some grief, if that's what's called for in the mm -hmm. in the circumstance, uh, goes a long goes a long way. So um, we, not just I, spent the whole year in 2005-6 listening to concerns about the plan. And then you know what? At the end of the day, uh, most people say, you know, I I wouldn't have done it exactly that way, but but I had an opportunity to express my opinion, and the process was was clearly valid and consultative mm -hmm. and open and let's move forward. Well, and part of the issue around change too is making sure you surround yourself with folks who kind of have that vision, advise you appropriately, but also kind of help you get through it. How did you kind of surround yourself with folks? How did you pick the folks that you well, were going to um, help with that? Well, you, you, you want to surround yourself with outstanding people, but not necessarily people who have exactly the same views as you do. And certainly, you want them to have uh, differences of perspective and expertise and, and talents. Right. It's really important to have a group of people around you who don't always just say yes or that's the right answer or I agree with what the previous person said. Um, I, uh, I, I pride myself on being a good listener and, and, on, uh, and, and on learning from those to whom I listen. Okay. And that includes people who say, no, Dick, um, that's really not the right way. We really should consider a different way of doing that. And we often, we often do. On the other hand, at the end of that process of listening, um, the, the leader needs to be able to say, OK, this is the way we're going. Right. And uh, that's what happened in the uh, task of reorganizing the New Brunswick campus. And it happens on a, on a smaller scale every day. Uh, an, an issue is brought forth, people express divergent opinions, everybody, myself included, learns from the conversation, mm -hmm. you make a decision and move forward. Or, or you decide you, we need more information and you, we're going to postpone the decision. But, but you, can't, you can't postpone important decisions too long. You've got right. to, there's got to be uh, some momentum behind the directions you're imparting to the university and uh, uh, deferring decisions is uh, often not a good idea. We, we talked a lot about New Brunswick. Um, how, what are your gayest accomplishments with regards to Newark and, and Camden? Well, it, it's, a, it's a timely question. Uh, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, has uh, 58,000 students, of whom 12,000 are in Newark and 6,000 are in Camden. And while those campuses are smaller than New Brunswick, they are critically important to the university. And it's, it's essential that the State University of New Jersey be represented in all the sections of the state, the south, the central, and the, and the north. Um, currently, there are some uh, <clears throat> ideas abroad for uh, taking Rutgers Camden out of Rutgers mm -hmm. and forming a University of South Jersey or, or merging Rutgers Camden with Newark. Um, I, don't, I don't support that. I don't support that plan. Um, I think uh, students, alumni, and faculty of Rutgers would be deeply disappointed to lose the Rutgers brand. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, having the State University of New Jersey, which is also the research university uh, present everywhere in the state, is a terribly good idea. So, so uh, and I, I would say exactly the same of Newark as, as well. Um, so those campuses aren't as big as New Brunswick, but they are integral to Rutgers.
Let's talk about a little bit about the Rutgers brand. One of the things that's kind of happened underneath your leadership is that there are magnet R's that have shown up on people's cars. There's the conversation within the state that I think folks have a different sense of wearing Rutgers sweatshirts, wearing Rutgers paraphernalia, um, and being very supportive of Rutgers in ways that they may have not have been a decade ago. Can you talk a little bit about how you kind of work to create some of that with the folks around well, you? Well, I, I, I think it was a I think it was a collective achievement. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that, by the way. Uh, there's a there's increasingly a buzz about Rutgers. There's no question about that. Um, larger numbers than ever before of uh, young men and women from New Jersey are applying to Rutgers, uh, and uh, and and are and are proud of their of their university. And people in New Jersey who don't have a particular connection with the institution are nonetheless increasingly proud of their state university. Right. In this in this respect, Rutgers is is moving in the direction of other great state universities mm -hmm. in the country. Um, that kind of pride and identification with the U uh, comes naturally to people, Americans in the Midwest yep. and in the South and in the Far West. I, I spent time in both North Carolina and Washington, so I know a bit about this. Um, for all kinds of historic reasons, um, it hasn't been as true in the Northeastern United States, mm -hmm. probably in part because there's so many great private colleges and universities in, in the Middle Atlantic and New England states, um, and, and probably for other reasons as well. Um, R Rutgers is uh, unusual history, to which I referred before when right. I said that not all parts of Rutgers were originally parts of Rutgers, and it has a cobbled together quality. Mm -hmm. I think that contributes as well. So, so we, have a, we have a goal to uh, overcome um, that, uh, that, that uh, sense of, of disparateness and uh, to encourage New Jerseyans to identify strongly with their state university. And I'm pleased that uh, during my time as president, a number, of, a number of steps forward has been taken, but there's still, there's still plenty of room for improvement. Well, at this particular point, my producer's telling us we have to go to break, so we'll be right back in a minute. Okay. Welcome back. We're going to continue our conversation with the Rutgers president, Rucker, Dr. Richard McCormick. Um, we're talking to him today about leadership. Um, every great leader has to go through issues of criticism. Sure. It's not always the easiest thing to listen to or easy thing to endure. So what's one of the things you can tell folks about how you deal with criticism as a leader? Yeah. Well, the, the, <clears throat> the first part of your question is absolutely correct. There is, there is criticism, and that's particularly true in... Uh, in a public political environment. Rutgers mm -hmm. is the State University of New Jersey. We are, we are obligated and responsible to the taxpayers of New Jersey and the elected officials of New Jersey and the media of New Jersey. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, every day, um, some representatives of those institutions have things to say about, mm -hmm. about Rutgers, whether it's about Rutgers athletics or how Rutgers spends its money or some individual or program at Rutgers they don't like or me. Right. Um, and, and it just goes with the it goes with the territory. Um, it's it's very important to think carefully about how you respond, or in many instances, choose not to respond. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you don't necessarily want to keep uh, a negativity al alive by by differing with it. Now, well, you got that fact wrong and this fact wrong, and let me say this again because it just it just perpetuates it. On the right. other hand, when there are issues of genuine importance that. Uh, uh, those in the public sector raise about the university, you have an obligation to reply, even if it, even if it makes for some uncomfortable moments. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, uh, the Star-Ledger spent a good deal of ink uh, concerning flaws in the way in which our ed athletics programs were administered. Right. And you know, they, they exaggerated the story and they uh, produced, uh, they said the same things again and again, but, but they, had, they had some of the basics right. Rutgers Athletics had grown very quickly, mm -hmm. and we hadn't uh, grown our management methodology uh, as fast as the program. And we needed to make some changes in how we, how we managed athletics and how transparent we were. We needed mm -hmm. to become more transparent ab about it, and, and we did. It was, a, it was a very uncomfortable six months, and the criticism was uh, understandably uh, directed at me mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, a very... A very tough report was issued by a committee that I appointed uh, toward the end of the period in, in question. Uh, 
It wasn't fun, but it was essential to, to, to take it, right. uh, to respond as effectively as we could, but also to make changes indicated by everything that had been learned. One of the things that leaders often learn about is having the ability to talk to somebody, having the ability to either be coached themselves, have an outlet, being able to talk. How, how do you do that? I mean, what do, you, what do you rely on in terms of being able to have those kind of sounding boards? Well, I have, a very, I have a very close relationship with the people that I work with most intimately. <clears throat> some, of the, some of the vice presidents and some of the others who work in or near my office. Okay. And I have a lot of confidence in them. And Pardon me. <coughs> talk freely with them about the challenges we're facing. And as I've indicated before, listen, listen to them. And that helps. Um, as you look back on your decade here, what would you say would be, would be your greatest <coughs> accomplishment, something you're very proud of? Yeah. Well, we've already talked about the reorganization yep. of the New Brunswick campus, so I'll, I'll, move on, I'll move on from that. The revitalization of the Livingston campus, where we are right now, uh, is another uh, development of which I'm very proud. For, for decades, Livingston was the forgotten campus of mm -hmm. Rutgers. Buildings were constructed, and a certain size was reached in the early 1970s, and with the exception of a few things that were constructed after that, not much changed. And by the time I became uh, president of Rutgers, uh, students at Livingston um, uh, had developed an inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. Students would tell me, I'm at Livingston because I'm not smart enough to get into Douglas or Rutgers. Oh, wow. And they would complain when they were assigned to live on Livingston, and they would complain that nothing's happening at Livingston. And, and by and large, they were, they were right. Not much was happening at Livingston. Um, but it also happens to be um, a, a terrific area. There's a lot of available land. We own a lot of property that has not yet been developed. Right. And with the uh, putting through of Route 18 that was completed a half dozen years ago, the transportation accessibility of Livingston is better than any other part of Rutgers. So um, we are uh, expanding and dramatically transforming that campus and have given it an academic vision that it hasn't had in quite mm -hmm. a while. On, the, uh, on, on uh, the, the student side of things, thanks to students who pressed hard, we doubled the size of the student center and renovated it entirely. Right. We built an entirely new, beautiful dining hall to replace the, uh, what had been the increasingly inadequate dining hall in Tillet. Mm -hmm. And that Tillet space, by the way, is being converted to classrooms, which are badly needed. Okay. Um, we're also constructing 1,500 new residence hall beds at Livingston. And they don't look like the dorms that I lived in when I went to college. <laughs> um, they are apartment style with uh, each apartment consisting of four single bedrooms, mm -hmm. living room, kitchen, and two bathrooms, and they're going to be enormously popular. Livingston it has already gone from being the, the campus that students are least, least attracted to, least want to be assigned to live right. on, to uh, the most attractive campus. It's become a magnet, yeah. Moreover, there is, as I mentioned, an, an academic vision here. The uh, uh, business school building, we broke ground mm -hmm. for it uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and it will be the first of several buildings that will plant a professional school campus here at Livingston. Uh, business, management, labor relations, uh, ed education, and social work. All schools that train professionals yep. that uh, particularly uh, focus at the master's degree level of education, though they have undergraduates right. as well. We're going to have a ho hotel and a conference center where those schools can carry on executive education and continuing education. So they'll reach populations that are not regularly matriculated right. Rutgers students. And again, the excellent availability of transportation will make it easy for the Livingston campus to become a hub of activities like that. Um, plans are being laid for a research park that will be here at the Livingston campus as well. And we're only a mile from our science campus and engineering campus at Bush. So there'll be a tremendous synergy between uh, the research park here at Livingston and the science mm -hmm. just a mile away. So uh, I, I am, uh, th this, this, we are now sitting right. uh, at the campus, which will show as much transformation in the 21st century as any part of Rutgers. It, I sometimes say this is our 21st century campus. I probably shouldn't say that because College Avenue, Douglas Cook, and Bush are also critically important. Absolutely. But I'm, I'm very proud of the transformation of Livingston. Um, every leader also has to look back and at sometimes see some challenges or some regrets um, or some you know hindsight that maybe I should have done this a little bit better or done something differently. For you, when you think back on that, what would that be for you? Well, uh, <coughs> I'm, a, I'm a New Jersey guy, so I, perhaps I can say this without, without too much criticism. 
Um, we don't we don't pay enough attention to aesthetics in New Jersey. We're we're content to have things look uh, shabbier than they ought to look. Okay. I know from my time in Chapel Hill in Seattle that it's not necessary. Um, Very different. And, and when I returned to Rutgers as president, I was particularly struck uh, that our College Avenue campus, the original campus of mm -hmm. Rutgers, the, the the home campus of Rutgers. Um, well, frankly, looked a lot shabbier than it should have. And I, I set forth a vision of which I'm very proud for transforming and greening that campus. Mm -hmm. and, and while we have improved the landscape architecture right. a, along the street, um, it, it's also the case that much of the vision that I set forth, and, and, and um, which inspired a lot of people, um, has not been realized. Um, and it would be a wonderful thing if in the years ahead the Rutgers community would return to the uh, the ideal right. of improving the attractiveness of College Avenue. Uh, but I would say the same of almost all of our campuses. Um, uh, ev everything at Rutgers, almost everything at Rutgers, could, could benefit from, uh, from looking better. Uh, and uh, it may not sound all that important. It may say, well, you know, we don't have enough money to do that. Um, right. we, don't, uh, we can't afford that. We'll, we'll fix up the buildings after we've solved all of our other problems. It doesn't work that way. There, it's all intrinsic. The way the place mm -hmm. looks contributes directly or fails to contribute to your ability to recruit and retain outstanding students and faculty. So the very quality of your programs is connected to what the campus looks like. So uh, you, you had talked about this a little bit earlier about being connected, being a faculty member here, having deep family roots here. What has it meant for you to come back as the president well, after? It meant, it, you know, <coughs> it, meant a, it meant a lot. Uh, Tomorrow, in fact, is my ninth uh, my ninth anniversary as president. Mm -hmm. So, I'm uh, I'm thinking about that, and uh, uh, I, I did have the privilege of growing up here, and I learned from my parents <coughs> at our family dinner table about the pride they took in Rutgers. Both of them had their careers at Rutgers. Mm -hmm. Both of them knew the institution very well, uh, cheered on its successes, and and winced when there was a setback. And and I learned that uh, I learned that early, and I learned from them the the deep value of public higher education, of all, the, of all the things it does, of all the constituencies it serves, of all the opportunities it enables people to realize, of what it can mean for the, for the state. So returning to Rutgers as president was a, was a return to the opportunity to fulfill dreams I had learned about from my mom and dad. Okay. And, and anybody would be proud of that. Um, let's talk a little bit. If, if, if <coughs> you had to write your last paragraph in this Targum tomorrow and say, this is Dr. McCormick's legacy as president, what would you want that last sentence or two to be in terms of your legacy? Well, I'd, I'd want it to include several things that we've talked about in this conversation. Right. The, the deepening of the connection between the Rutgers and the people of yep. New Jersey. Um, the improvement of our academic programs, and something we haven't mentioned in this conversation, um, the, uh, the, the gaining of revenues from places other than the state of New Jersey. Uh, taxpayers in New Jersey pay uh, only 22% uh, of the cost of, of Rutgers. Okay. They have a $2.1 billion budget, 400 and some million dollars come from, from New Jersey. Uh, a very large amount of money, mm -hmm. um, but only the minority of the total resources upon which this, res of this university depends. And uh, although we haven't talked about budget issues today, I, I am very proud of the addition of other revenues to the state's support. We mentioned the uh, reorganization of yep. the New Brunswick campus and the transformation of Livingston. Uh, so those are four. Those are four things that I'm and they're particularly huge proud things. of. They are. There are four huge things. Let, let's take a little time and talk about the budget piece. It's, okay. It's, an, it's inevitable. I mean. Um, as the state institution, we, I think we were in the crosshairs. We every time when the budget issue came up, we you know have been put on notice several times over by the state in terms of funding issues. And you've kind of led the charge to kind of look at the state and say, "Hey, wait a second, we have to value higher education." Right. And you've had to make some tough decisions around those areas. Right. Uh, however, uh, neither I nor any other college president in America these days has been terribly successful in leading that charge. Uh, the states are spending less and less on higher education. My, <clears throat> since I referenced my parents a moment ago, I'll, I'll do so again in a different context. Members of that generation of Americans mm -hmm. believed in public higher education and believed in investments on the grounds that the whole society benefited. Not just those who got the degree, but the whole society was 
uplifted medical advances, the improvement of democracy, the solution to social problems, all flow from investments in colleges and universities. Absolutely. I'm not so sure Americans believe that anymore. They know that if you get a Rutgers degree or you get a degree from an institution, you benefit, you earn more money. But the collective benefits that, that justify significant investments by taxpayers in colleges and universities, well, belief in that has, has waned. Okay. And so in New Jersey, as well as elsewhere in America, the percentage of the state budget that goes to colleges and universities has gone down pretty mm -hmm. steadily in the last several decades. That means that students are paying significantly more of the cost for their education. <coughs> and that should cause us to worry about whether access and opportunity can be maintained for the generations ahead. But it also has meant that institutions bear the responsibility of finding other resources. Correct. Uh, if, if Rutgers were to depend entirely upon the taxpayers of New Jersey to realize the dreams and aspirations that we have as an institution, uh, we, would, we would be disappointed. Okay. So the uh, universities like ours uh, have, to, have to develop other revenue streams. Some of it is philanthropic. Mm -hmm. A great deal of it comes from our faculty who bring in support for their research. Yep. Rutgers faculty brought in $400 million of support for their research last year. Much of it comes through the efforts of entrepreneurial faculty and deans who have forged new academic programs, responding to the needs of students, for example, the continuing education and executive education right. students I mentioned a moment ago, students that we're not currently teaching, but to whom we have a lot to offer, yep. and guess what, who come with uh, their checkbooks in their hands mm -hmm. to pay for what they're getting, and, and in the process helping to support the whole university. We have one <coughs> minute left, so I think everybody's interested. What's next for you? What's next for me? is returning to the Rutgers faculty, okay. which I first joined as a, as a young history professor in 1976, 35 okay. years ago. Uh, I, uh, I'll have the privilege of uh, being on the Rutgers faculty. I hope to teach some history, Good. and I hope to teach uh, something about higher education as well. The Graduate School of Education is forming a new PhD program in higher education, yep. and I'm proud to say that the dean has asked me to teach in Good. that. So uh, I hope to make a contribution. I hope to write a couple of books as well, and to be a to, to be a faculty member in all of the in all of the rich senses of the of the term. Well, well here at Rutgers, want to wish you good luck. We're happy to see you around Thank campus, you. and I'll we're excited to campus. see what students have to say when they have you in class, and Great. have you back around. So we appreciate that. And thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. Well, that's all we have for this edition of Breakfast at the Barracks. For more inf information about any of the subjects we discussed here today, please visit our website at Rutgers.tv. For all of us at the Division of Continuing Studies, I'm Bill Leopold, and thank you for watching. <laughs>